Well, hello, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to another episode of the Civil Richmond's podcast. I'm really happy uh, to have a more um, free-for-all fun conversation tonight with uh, um, a friend and and uh, a former guest, Eric Money from Pennsylvania. And Eric uh, is renowned for his Pennsylvania Reserves knowledge, uh, among uh, many other local history in Pennsylvania and the regiments. And what better person to talk to sometimes to really deep dive into um, the regiments, especially the regiments of the Army of Potomac, uh, many of those fighting regiments from Pennsylvania during the Civil War. And so I'm excited to have a, a fun chat tonight. So Eric, thank you for coming on the show, man. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Stephen. Don't build me up too much, man. <laughs> yeah. Which is going to be a I, huge disappointment. No, no. In fact, I'm I, no no joke. Um, I interviewed you, uh, for those listening, you know, the episode, I interviewed Eric about a year and a half ago on season one. And, um, it's still one of my personal favorite episodes because we really, <laughs> we had a, a nice conversation about everything Gettysburg, the regiments of Gettysburg. We, we spent a lot of time talking about the first Minnesota event, um, that oh, yeah. Eric spectated and I participated in and, I'll never forget that. So it was a memorable, and then I'll never forget just randomly running into Eric, uh, outside the i think it was the image shop the the pennsylvania bucktail shop yeah i think it was right there. outside ron palms yeah yeah, I, I, yeah I was going in there at the same time yeah yeah exactly yeah. so you never know who you'll run into in gettysburg sometimes <laughs> so but no it's a thrill to have you eric and um it's good to have you um come back on the show and uh, uh well, thanks and, man i appreciate it yeah awesome awesome and i, I was just joking earlier about how uh uh, I've progressed a lot with the show since the last time <laughs> we have video now guys. Yeah. So, uh, we're really, we're really in the new century now. So crushing, but it. yeah, killing it. <laughs> but, but Eric, um, I figure one thing I do want to bring up is, um, and if you follow Eric on social media, you may have seen that, um, uh, you gave a talk recently on the Bucktails. Was it Monday oh, night? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Feel free. Uh, tell me, uh, how did that go, and what did you talk about exactly uh, this last Monday night? Well, so I got invited to uh, Kerwinsville, PA, to talk to the uh, Kerwinsville Historical Society. Um, Kerwinsville, in in Civil War realm, uh, contributed quite a bit uh, to the various Bucktail regiments, right? Uh, so Company K of the 1st PA Rifles, uh, part of the reserves, they came from Kerwinsville. Company B, 149th PA, was primarily from Kerwinsville. And then Company E uh, of the 149th was from Clearfield County uh, overall, uh, but probably about half of that company also came uh, from Kerwinsville. Uh, so they're they're all about it. Right. Uh, they, they're one of the counties with the highest density of, of bucktail companies uh, in the state. I think the only wow. other one that really like approaches their numbers uh, would be Tioga. Uh, they had three. Well, depends on how you count either three or three and a half uh, of the uh, the bucktail companies from that county. Anyways, uh, they asked me to come down and talk about bucktails. Right. Well, that's kind of. That's kind of difficult to do in an hour. Um, first and foremost, the, you have the three separate regiments, right? The first rifles, the 149th and the 150th. Uh, and the 149th and 150th have, you know, a very similar story because they're brigaded together uh, for basically their entire existence. Uh, but the first rifles is very much different. Um, they are never, they are never, uh, really associated with the the other two um and yeah. there's there was actually quite a bit of animosity between uh the rifles and the second and third bucktails right uh they don't ever really get along um but kerwinsville historical society wanted me to come talk about bucktails in general and i said well i can't really talk about 149th stuff that's not really my my focus right i've i've been focused on pa reserves and, and old bucktails for several years now um i'm actually working on a book about that but i i even if it was it would be hard to shoehorn those histories into the same hour 
Um, it's hard enough shoehorning any of them individually into an hour, much less, you know, two of them. Um, so I went down and I talked about old bucktails, the first rifles. Uh, and we did basically a, a, a really brief, as brief as I could make it, history <laughs> of the regiment, uh, up until the Gettysburg campaign. Uh, and then, uh, we had a particular focus on the Gettysburg campaign, and then I kind of wrapped it up with a really brief, uh, really brief explanation of their their history after Gettysburg. Um, I thought I bombed because <laughs> that's my default. I just default yeah. to, oh my god, I, it was terrible. <laughs> Everybody hated it. Um, but my wife tells me it was good, and I trust her judgment. Uh, because we critique each other's work uh, <laughs> mercilessly, <laughs> so she says it was good. I'll I'll go with that. But uh, yeah, it, it went pretty well by all accounts. Um, I did, uh, and this is really exciting, and I'm very happy to get a hold of this stuff. Uh, a fellow approached me after the talk um, and offered me two letter groupings. Um, one of them is from uh, three brothers, the McDonald brothers in Company K of the Old Rifles. Uh, these are unknown letters. These, nobody's wow. ever seen them outside of like oh my gosh. half a dozen people in Kerwinsville, but they've never been published, none of that. Um, he has all of their letters uh, from the war, and he has a grouping from – he didn't know offhand what battery it was, but a, a, an artilleryman from Kerwinsville. Uh, his letters and uh, the responses to his letters, right? So it's both sides of that conversation uh, throughout the course of the war. But uh, I have to go to the tannery next week. When I go to the tannery on Tuesday, uh, I'm going to meet up with him, and he's going to give me copies of like wow. it's, it's something like 160 letters, wow. right? It's okay. it's like a book, right? Um, <laughs> So I'm like really excited to start digging into this because he's talking about, you know, because he's read them all. Okay. Um, some of them are undated, so they had to read them to know like the chronological order to put them in. Um, and he's talking about, you know, there are there's uh, descriptions of the Battle of Drainsville, right, in December of '61. From a bucktail perspective, there really aren't any um, like primary source. Uh, descriptions of Drainsville, right? There's, there's John Bard, right? But it's very brief. He doesn't really talk a whole lot about it. And I don't necessarily consider it primary source because he wrote it for a newspaper article, uh, in the 1890s. Gotcha. Um, and then there's the regimental history, but that's never a primary source. And you really should never consider any regimental history to be a primary source. Um, uh, so I'm like super excited to get a hold of this stack wow. of letters uh and find out what i can uh about anything and everything bucktails you see that's that's just what's exciting you know it's like that yes all these many years later there can still right. be new discoveries and new stories heard and told right. and, and oh my gosh yeah wow we, um, that's so exciting i i don't reenact anymore personally um but i am still associated with with some of the, the bucktail reenacting groups um, and every year we hold a reunion, right, all over the state. Last year was in Gettysburg. Uh, this year is going to be in Kane, Pennsylvania. Um, but a couple of years ago in Kerwinsville, PA, there was a guy who came to the reunion from out around Williamsport. Uh, it's a couple hours away from here. And uh, he brought he brought a a set of Company E diaries right this guy's wartime journals and I, if i remember correctly there were five or six of them and it basically covered his entire term of enlistment what? that he had found uh in the attic of a house that he had bought uh the previous somebody in the, one of the previous tenants had just like stuck it stuck it on a ledge above the, the attic steps in a box uh and just left it there Right. So like I want to get old of that guy. So I know. 
go through all those. I, like, I, there's so many cool things that are still out there. And um, it makes you wonder how much is still hiding. <laughs> right. It's not yet to be discovered hiding in someone's attic. And right. I don't know about you, Eric, but uh, I've heard already on a couple of interviews, and you, and you may have heard this too, where <laughs> it's a common trend, it seems, lately at auctions and things where they're auctioning letters and diaries separately. Like, it'll be individual soldiers' letters, but they're selling them off separately. And I think that's a total travesty. I, I think why that would should... you split those letters up, you know? Right. I, I think that should be... <sighs> that should be punishable by... <laughs> Oh man! Well, Just you can't tell things. the full story you, without right, all the exactly. pieces together. I, exactly, and so what you've done. And see, this is this is uh, an argument I have uh, with collectors uh, all the time, right? And some people get it, and some people don't. As a collector, you don't really own that artifact, right? You, I, yeah, legally you own it, right? There's nothing that prevents you from, you know, uh, taking a taking a stack of original letters out in your backyard and lighting them on fire if you want to. Like, you're not going to be prosecuted for anything like that because it's your property. However, in the broader in the broader context, as a collector, you've really only paid for the privilege of being a temporary caretaker of whatever it is that you have in your collection, right? And so I look at it. The same way, uh, like like kind of uh, kind of like the Hippocratic Oath, right? Do no harm, right? So as a collector, yeah, okay. So there are certain certain things like uh, I collect books, right? And I have I have a copy of the uh, the general orders for the volunteer force for sixty one, sixty two, sixty three, um, but it's identified to the adjutant of the one hundred and fifth Pennsylvania. Right now, when I got it, the spine was separated. Okay, so I have two things that I can do there. I can either leave it as is; uh, it'll be in 100% original condition, uh, or I can have a book restorer fix that, which is what I ended up doing. Um, and he does it in such a way that it's as unobtrusive as it possibly can be, um, and it. It, it made it a solid object for whoever gets it after me, right? But but there are a lot of collectors that don't understand that you're not – like this isn't really your property, especially intellectual stuff like, like diaries, letters, books, things like that. It's not really yours. It kind of belongs to all of us. You've paid for the privilege of, of being the one that gets to put it in your the house caretaker. for the time being. Right. But eventually, either you're going to sell it, uh, you'll die, uh, something will happen that it will no longer be in your possession. Right. Your your object should be to take care of it for whoever comes next. Um, and so splitting up groupings is just unconscionable to me. I, I don't understand how people can live with themselves knowing that they had. You know, they had this grouping that told maybe not a complete story, but a much more complete story than an individual letter or even an individual journal. Because, you know, most of these guys weren't keeping a single journal for the entire war. You know, your journal may only cover six months to a year. Right. And then you have to get a new one. So you might end up like that guy from from out near Williamsport with a stack of five or six of them that cover, you know, a, a three or four year time period of this person's life. Well, if you take one of those out, you've just removed a massive chunk of the story. And, it, and is it really your right to do that? I would argue no, there, but legally, yeah, it, it, it absolutely is. I just think it's disgusting. Well, Sorry. you know, I won't proselytize anymore. No, no, I I'm with you, man, because exactly like what, what if let's just say you had a series of Gettysburg letters or like, or diary entries, letters where right. it's like the date, it's like the night before Gettysburg, this guy found out that his mother died. And then mm -hmm. the very next day he's writing about the battle. But that just tells you a lot about what his emotions would be that next day. Right. Or, you know, like it tells the whole story. And right. to me, that's just, um, we're also 
like um, I've learned to grow to appreciate, you know, that uh, and we talked a bit about this last time we talked, we're almost like talking about, you know, we tend to focus on the regiments that had more casualties versus the right. ones that, that didn't. But like uh, the other temptation sometimes is um, when I was when I first started reading all these diaries and letters, you know, I, I was skipping to the battle scenes, right? Almost like when no, you're a kid. Course. And right. like the first time I watched the movie Gettysburg, I, I, when I had that VHS tape, I, I, I kept fast forward to the battle scenes. But then, right. uh, but when I read these diaries, I was like, okay, boring camp stuff, camp stuff, camp stuff. Let me get to the battle. Now I'm like, I want to know what that guy was cooking that night. And I want to know like, <laughs> where did they camp at? Okay. What's that location? Like that fascinates me now where it's like, right. I do, I'm, I'm anxious to hear those in between things that people may not value as much as like what the guy wrote about his Gettysburg experience. But the in-between stuff is fascinating and it's a travesty yeah, to, to and, miss and out I mean, on that. Like I, you know, it's the same thing, you know, it's one thing to, it's one thing to criticize George Meade's handling of the Gettysburg campaign, you know, post July 4th. It's another thing entirely to understand that he is, he is conducting himself the way that he is because a, he just went three days without sleeping. Uh, half of his army doesn't have shoes. Nobody's been fed since uh, June 30th, uh, and his animals are dying off or just going lame uh, because they haven't been fed either, right? I, so yeah. it, 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 it's it's a much different story when you take it, you know, out of out of context. Then you know you you add in all the little things, the mundane details that most people skip because it's not. You know, it's not gory and bloodshed, and yeah. You no, know, uh, I'm, I'm, this I'm, reminds I'm me. Um, I'm trying to find it. Um, because I, I feel like, yeah, I found it. It's right here. <laughs> um, I um, I'm cheating. I'm using my books as sources here. <laughs> but um, uh, what you said <clears throat> to me, I can't say enough about what what Mead went through, and he Mead has had letter that he wrote to his wife talking about how how rugged and how he hadn't eaten in several days and hadn't right. changed his clothes in several days and but one thing that so many people just uh and i've shared this online before but um the amount of federal soldiers with with no shoes or barefoot during the gettysburg campaign yeah and we just we're so used to like confederates had no shoes confederates had no shoes confederates had no shoes union had everything union had everything we just we right. You hear that in the general history so much that you forget. And so, uh, for example, the Sixth Corps, um, who did the the crazy 35, 40-mile march to Gettysburg to get right. there uh, in time right. for From Westminster. half the battle. Uh, <laughs> but, like, I heard all these accounts, and I read all these accounts, I mean, where these guys are marching so long that they are wearing out their shoes completely. And yeah, absolutely. This is one. this is from a Pennsylvania boy right here. This is uh this is an entry from the 139th PA. And uh it's about a a particular individual. And uh this guy says he's describing the march. I see the faces of company eyes boys before me who after their shoes were worn out tied up their feet in cloths to protect them from the hot sand and tramped cheerfully on. Some of you will remember Big Joe Walker of Company C. Corporal Walker had been most liberally endowed by nature in a physical way. And had equally large understandings. Joe and his chum, Sam Grinder, had made requisition upon the quartermaster, each for a pair of number 12s. But as every case of shoes did not have usually more than one pair of that size, the quartermaster was not able to honor their order just at that time. Joe's shoes had given out. One day he was stepping out in as soldierly a way as possible with bare feet. One of his comrades called out, Hello, Joe. How are you getting along with those feet? That is pretty hard luck. The old veteran replied promptly, Oh, I am all right. If the Johnny Rebs are going up to Pennsylvania, they will find me there too if I have to wear these feet up to my stumps. Joe got there and did his duty too. Poor fellow, he afterwards left one of his legs down in that same country. Captain William Herbert, 139th PA. But anyway, uh, that's just one example. of uh, Yeah, that, that quote always sticks with me, which honestly, man, the, the Pennsylvania accounts, uh, soldiers' accounts for the Gettysburg campaign are, are so much different than, I mean, so many amazing accounts from all the states involved. Right. But Pennsylvania, like these guys, 
just like soldiers from Virginia all war long are fighting in their homeland, like Pennsylvanians, like Gettysburg battle is on their soil. And so you yeah, have all exactly. these, um, which part of me, and I'd like to get your take on this because there's so many, I feel like a lot of regimental histories too talk about how at least every Colonel of every Pennsylvania regiment had some pep talk. Right. And sometimes I wonder how much of that was in the moment or later on, you know, and there's one, um, it's in that same book. Uh, I think it's from the 98th PA maybe where this 93rd. guy, the 93rd, is that the famous, is yeah. like the old Colonel of the regiment. And right. he stood on a stump, a tree stump, and he gave this big, long, epic speech as they're right. marching and to Pennsylvania. I, for the life of me, I cannot remember what his name is. I know it starts with Mick something. Um, but he's got like, I, you, you see that one photo of him, and he's got his hair like sticking straight up. It's it's incredible. Um, or he kind of looks like Santa Claus, doesn't he? <laughs> I'm no, no. Like he's got. Um, Oh man, I wish I could remember his name offhand. It wasn't James McCarter. McCarter, was it? James McCarter. Yeah, um, that's the dude. Yeah, that's so James that's a McCarter. One. There's gotcha. a there's like an actual CDV of him, um, uh, you know, in his in his officer's uniform, and he's standing, but like the front half of his hair is just sticking straight up. It's wild looking, <laughs> like Christopher Walken. Um, yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's crazy, um, but that. That like that one a- appears to be kind of a post-war thing. Um, the only, okay, I, I haven't found like I haven't found anything earlier, uh, at least published, other than Pennsylvania at Gettysburg, right? That that seems to be where that originated from. Okay, um, that that version of the speech, anyway, that one that we all know about. Uh, uh, fell treasons, foul foot, and all that. Um, it it prob there probably was something similar to that, uh, but it was I would imagine much shorter, not quite as eloquent. Well, they wouldn't um, have that much time, right? <laughs> but he was a preacher, so I, who knows? Um, but who wrote that down verbatim and then I know. included it in their dedication speech <laughs> 30 years after the fact or 25 years after the fact. Uh, and then it got published uh, <laughs> word for word. Like, come on. I, yeah. Yeah. There, there probably was a pep talk. It may have been eloquent because he was a preacher. It probably wasn't exactly what this is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cause it's think like, about the amount you, of marching these guys had to do. Right, absolutely. They got to get moving. Like everybody's exhausted to begin with, especially the Sixth Corps, right? Like that's the other thing. The 93rd PA is in the Sixth Corps, so like when they're crossing the state line, they're in the midst of their 32-mile forced march from Westminster to Gettysburg. Like how many people were even paying attention to what this man was saying as opposed to like, you know, changing socks or or if they even had socks and shoes left? Uh, trying to get water to fill the canteen or, or making coffee, right? Like who was really paying attention to it? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I haven't found really any, um, for like the Pennsylvania reserves. Uh, they, I like none of the, none of the primary sources that I've come across really mention anything like that. Um, they do talk about quite a bit though, being like exhausted uh, because the fifth Corps went basically from uh, like union bridge, Maryland to Hanover to Gettysburg in like 36 hours. Yeah. Right. That's, that's a hike. Yeah. Like like they're exhausted too. We always talk about the the sixth Corps because they basically, you know, they went from Westminster to Gettysburg into line. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas the fifth Corps had a few hours to in reserve over at powers Hill, but well, well uh, didn't, um, I was just thinking about this actually heard today and, mm-hmm. and I know you can correct me about this. I'm, I'm going to set the scene a little bit for this, but, um, <laughs> have you, are you, have you seen the Lord of the Rings movies? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. One of my favorite, a lot of people are Lord of the Rings. Um, do you remember the scene when in return of the King, I think when the, the Rohan, 
the Riders of Rohan arrive to uh, Gondor to you know to save the day, and they're going to oh, charge right. into like, the orc army, and yeah, they come yeah. up. King Felden's leading them up the ridge, and they're mm-hmm. going to charge down. Anyway, I just set the scene with that in mind. Um, so, I the reserves, the Pennsylvania reserves, are marching from Washington to Gettysburg, mm-hmm. um, and they arrive late in the day. So, like, set the scene late in the day, July second. Mayhem is happening on Little Round Top. Mayhem is happening in the wheat field. The U.S. regulars, um, another badass bunch, are, are getting driven out yeah. of the wheat field. And um, which, by the way, I'll never forget how they got butchered basically by about facing <laughs> down Hawks Ridge right. towards Little Round Top. And they all got shot in the back basically. And then, but the way I can't remember, and you probably remember something, but I remember reading an account. It's either from a regular's perspective or it's from a reserve's perspective. And the way it's written, it just sounds just like that scene in Return of the King where it's like, like I think it's a regular writing about how like he looked over like all this carnage in the wheat field. The Confederates are closing in. And then he looked up on the ridge and there comes Sam Crawford coming around right. Epic. And then like the whole reserves behind him and they're on the slope of Little Round Top. And he's like, right when everything seemed to be falling apart, the Pennsylvania Reserves come and, and punch Hood's rebels in the mouth, you know. And right. uh, I, every time I hear that, I think of that scene in Lord of the Rings. But um, I think that is the account of the Sergeant Major of the 11th U.S. Let me see if I have my notes handy. Uh, and I do not. Um, and I don't <laughs> remember his name offhand. Um, but yeah, there there is a and that's also uh, included in Pennsylvania at Gettysburg is the Sergeant Major's account. It's something like it's at least a page long, um, but it, it goes into detail about, you know, watching the reserves sweep down and, and into the wheat field. And, you know, he and he had been wounded and, and he's laying behind a rock with a couple of lieutenants uh, who had also been wounded um, in their, uh, you know they're they're bypassed by by rebels who who capture them uh, in the same moment, but they don't send them back because they've got you know they've got bigger fish to fry, mm. and uh, they they come tumbling back a few minutes later is I think is the the, the word he uses, <laughs> uh, and they they go back across the wheat field, but he talks about uh, they start firing at him and these these two lieutenants that are laying behind this rock. Uh, until they like, they make their way around the opposite side, so they didn't even shot. But that 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 was a really interesting, uh, really interesting account. Um, yeah, I haven't seen the original of it. Uh, the only the only thing I found, and I'm not saying it doesn't exist out there. Uh, the only one that I've read is what's published in in Pennsylvania at Gettysburg. Um, but yeah, no, that's uh, that yeah. is a neat account. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I've always been a big fan of the one from uh, the 118th Pennsylvania. Like a lot of people have heard the story about uh, hogs rooting the wounded and dead in the wheat field, right? Well, most people don't really know where that originated from. Is a lieutenant in Company E of the 118th. Yeah, um, and it's published in the regimental history. Um, so there's there's his story about. Um, uh, He's laying there wounded in the field at night. Um, this particularly large hog comes up to him uh, and he ends up stabbing it uh, with his sword. Uh, and then he talks about he, he basically had to fend off uh, other pigs throughout the course of the night. Um, but there's also another really neat uh, story that's like a page or two ahead of that in that regimental history where they're laying in line. And uh, the the rebels are coming closer, but they haven't actually engaged each other yet. And this rabbit jumps on the back of a dude. Um, I forget what company from. And he, he basically throws himself over onto his back, yelling about how he's been killed and, and all these things uh, until everybody figures out it was just a rabbit that had jumped onto his back. Uh, and then apparently they all give him hell for it. But uh, that that was... That's a really funny account too. If you find I, I that. found it, I found that account, oh, but I don't have the name of the dude. But I know it's from the regimental history, right? But right. yeah, uh, the poor little rabbit had innocently been the cause of his discomfort. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's, and then that the lieutenant who got attacked by the <laughs> hogs was uh, Barzilla Inman. Yep. Barzilla lieutenant e. Barzilla Inman. In, what's that? Barzilla Inman. Uh, Inman. I think Company gotcha. E, right? Company I e don't have company it listed. F. Okay. I didn't list the company. But, but yeah, a number of stray hogs came to where he was lying. Yep. And he jammed his sword into the belly of the hog. Uh, and it gave a sharp, prolonged cry. Right. Uh, and then he fought off the monsters till daylight. <laughs> yep. Yep. Wow. Well, but and no, so that, that's, I mean, that's, that's I, crazy. as far as I'm aware, that is the origin yeah. of that story. Anyway. Well, you know, um, I may have brought this up with you before, and uh, but it kind of tickles me every time I, I hear the story. But what do you know about uh, that confrontation, apparently, that happened with Joseph Fisher and Joshua Chamberlain on Big Round Top, where uh, I remember, like it's documented somewhere, or I think Fisher wrote about it, or one of the reserves guys wrote about how um, Fisher and Chamberlain got into it. Do you do you know what I'm talking about? I right. Um, I haven't read anything that that said they got into like a shouting match. Um, they did. So Fisher didn't write much. After the war, um, I've really only seen uh, two instances where he is defending his brigade at Gettysburg. Um, but other than that, he kind of stays silent. It was almost like uh, almost yeah. like George Sykes, where he doesn't say anything yeah. unless it's yeah. something that like it, you know, it really chapped his ass uh, when when the Third Corps, you know, blamed the Fifth Corps for not showing up in time because they were making coffee. And that's what finally got. George Sykes to say anything, but he was silent again after that. Um, Fisher's kind of the same way. But if you go through the National Tribune, and there was a really good book done by Richard Sowers a number of years ago. You can still find it. I, you know what I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. um, where he went through all of the issues of the National Tribune. And not only did he catalog like every, every issue that talked about um, – Gettysburg at all. Um, he also like handily in the index gives you like what that article was about, what issue you can find it in, who wrote it. Um, but he also published a bunch of them uh, in total, right? And so the rebuttals you, too. Yeah, exactly. So there's yeah. some of these. There's some of these where it's you know you see a back and forth between these guys uh, over the course of months, uh, which is a fairly common occurrence in the National Tribune. But uh, you can see that there is there is this argument between 20th Maine veterans and members of Fisher's Brigade in the post-war era about, you know, what happened, right? So, so Chamberlain, in his, in his 1883 uh, report, right, because a lot of people don't know this, Chamberlain got a redo on his official report in the 1880s. They had lost the original one, knew he had filed one. And so they approached him and said, hey, would you rewrite your report for us? And this is not – this isn't like an uncommon occurrence either. Like this happened several times. Um, but this is the one we're talking about. Uh, so he rewrites his report. It gets published in the ORs, and that gets taken as gospel uh, up until about 10 years ago when somebody at the Maine State Archives found an original July 6th copy of his report in a desk drawer uh, in the Maine State Archives. And now handily, uh, you can go onto their website. I think it's digitalmaine.com uh, or something to that effect. Wow. And you can okay. read his original July 6th report. And not only are they like vastly different from each other, um, but you can tell in his 1880s report, he's trying to gather as much credit unto himself as he can for everything that happened on that end of the line. Uh, because there really isn't anybody left to, to dispute him. Right. I, everybody I, like, you know, uh, strong Vincent's dead. Uh, <laughs> James Rice is dead within a year. Uh, the fellow, and I can't remember his name offhand, the fellow who was commanding the 16th Michigan died fairly young. Uh, Norval Welch. Yeah, Norval or Welch. Orpheus Woodward. Norval Welch is the one yeah. I'm thinking of. Yeah. I think he died in the 1870s, yeah. uh, 72, 73, somewhere around there. Um, 
So there's not really anybody to, to dispute what he's saying. So he gets to say whatever he wants to. And he says that, you know, uh, Fisher's brigade refused to go up big round top. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, basically refused to go up big round top because they had in, insufficient arms. Right. Which sounds ridiculous. Like on the face of it, like, hey, what, you didn't come with enough guns? Well, no, what they're saying is, okay, you've been resupplied with ammunition at this point because we brought it to you. Um, you have rifled muskets. The 5th, 9th, 10th, and 12th reserves are all entirely armed with smoothbore 42s. Well, who do you want to have on a picket line or acting as skirmishers? The guys with smoothbore muskets or the guys who have rifles? The rifles, yep. right? Uh, yep. Chamberlain tries to take credit for it being his idea. Fisher disputes that. He says it's uh, um, between him and uh, James C. Rice, who's the brigade commander at that point. Um, Chamberlain likes to say he's in command of this entire expedition, and Fisher basically says that makes absolutely no sense. I was the senior. Uh, I was the senior officer. Not only that. Uh, I wasn't just the senior regimental commander. I was already a brigade commander at the time. Like that argument makes no sense. Um, Chamberlain at one point <laughs> blames, um, I think the, well, he blames the fifth and 12th reserves. He doesn't say which regiment specifically uh, for firing into his men uh, at night on the Hill. Um, they have a very different outlook on it. Uh, they say that they've been fired into their front. Um, from relatively close, but there shouldn't have been any enemy there. Uh, and so they actually withdraw down the hill a little bit uh, to try to figure out what's going on. Uh, they're also having these problems, and they the, the reserves themselves say this, they're having these issues getting up the hill uh, in line of battle. And if you've ever gone up the old soldier's trail on Big Round Top, um, it is incredibly rocky. And would be nigh on impossible to get up in the dark uh, in any sort of sort of like organized formation. So they talk about they get about three half or three quarters of the way up the hill. They are so jumbled together, the fifth and twelfth reserves, that their officers can't make out who belongs to who, uh, and so they would draw back down the hill and start over <laughs> uh, to get up to the top. And when they get up to the top. They're fired at. Um, they withdraw a little bit to figure out what's going on, and you know they reoccupy the top of the hill. But uh, I, I am, I am not a huge fan of Joshua Chamberlain. Um, very much, not entirely, but it doesn't help that that he's trash talking my reserves yeah, in yeah. in the post war yeah. period. Stay um, in your lane, Chamberlain. Well, um, you know. But, <laughs> well, you know, uh, that actually, uh, that just made me think of something. Uh, af eventually, when Chamberlain did get promoted to brigade command, didn't he command mm -hmm. a brigade of Pennsylvanians? Like two new regiments, like the, I'm thinking like the 198th PA or like the 187th PA, like it was two higher number yeah. Pennsylvania regiments. Yeah, um, but I, I so. don't ask me to don't ask me to tell you what his brigade was made up of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you know, uh, one thing I thought about Eric is, um, of course, we, it's just so easy. We talk about Gettysburg all the time, and I could talk about right. <laughs> Gettysburg all day. And and last time, you know, we talked a lot, and and I, your talk the other night, you know, was a lot on the bucktails at, at Gettysburg, but yeah. You know, going back to the reserves again, and and we highlighted them a little bit last time we talked, mm -hmm. and but we tend to like quickly go over sometimes like the 1862 campaigns or the 1864 oh my God. campaigns. Yeah, they they and get so, blazed over. Please, you know, uh, I'd love to hear more myself because I know, you know, the reserves as we know them in Gettysburg, they're they're battered. They're Right, dreadfully dwindled in numbers right. with from all those campaigns, and so if you could highlight maybe a particular <laughs> battle or, or campaign that doesn't get much attention that they witnessed. Oh my in. God, 1862 entirely. Um, yeah, or I, hell, even Drainsville. Right, Drainsville. 
I don't know, know anything this, about Drainsville. I'll be honest with right, you. Right. So uh, Edward Ord, um, who most people will know from the Western Theater, right? When the reserves are formed in '61, uh, the the division commander is George McCall. Right. He's an mm-hmm. old man. He is 59 years old. He had already retired after 30 years in the army in, I think, 1853. Right. Um, but he's called back into service. The, the three brigade commanders under him are, uh, John F. Reynolds, George Gordon Meade, and Edward O.C. Ord. Right. Um, the, the first two are very famous or a little bit less so unless you're like, you know, involved in the Western theater. Um, but, you know, in I think it's March of 62, he he goes out west, uh, takes command of a division. Uh, and then when John McLaren is uh, is booted, uh, as it were, uh, he takes over, he takes command of McLaren corps, core. Uh, and, you know, he's he's fighting out west or out west. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Through the rest of the war, he ends up taking yeah. over command of the Army of the James eventually, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and and he is one of three Pennsylvania reserves uh, at Lee's surrender at Appomattox, right? The other ones being Truman Seymour uh, and Samuel Crawford, uh, both of whom were at Fort Sumter. Uh, Truman right. Seymour, Truman Seymour was a battery commander there. Yeah, uh, he ended up being the first chief of artillery for the reserves. Uh, and then Samuel Crawford, who took command of the division in March of 63, uh, was the post surgeon mm-hmm. um, because he, was, he wasn't an infantry officer until just after uh, Sumter. Um, so Ord, who is commanding one of the brigades, gets ordered to go out to Drainsville uh, to see about what rebels are, are poking around out there. They've got these reports that there's Confederates in the area and uh as kind of a like a side quest, uh, they need to gather in some forage uh, for animals. Um, so they go to Drainsville, December 20th of 61. Uh, they run into this like weird mixed composition brigade under Jeb Stewart, right? Uh, there's there's something like 3,000 uh, men with Ord. Stewart's got like 15 or 1,600, somewhere around there. Uh, I'm sorry, Ord has like 4,000 men with him. Um, and Stewart has like 15, 1600, just, just, excuse me, this huge disparity in numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. and they throw, uh, they throw Jeb Stewart out of Drainsville, um, so rapidly, apparently that, uh, uh, a couple of the reserves talk about not being able to physically catch these dudes. Uh, on the road because they're running so fast and they capture, uh, they capture some artillery and, and things like that. Um, but that in and of itself is, is a pretty, pretty small battle with basically no consequence. Aside from the fact that it is the first success that the Army of the Potomac has had, right? Uh, up until now, and, mm-hmm. and we're not talking about anything that happened in the Mountain District in West Virginia. That's not the same army. Um, we've had Bull Run, which is uh, – that doesn't that doesn't go well. Yeah, uh, Ball's Bluff. Ball's Bluff, right? Uh, and then you've got Drainsville, right? Their first real victory. Uh, but that doesn't really get talked about. And if you go to try to visit any of the Drainsville battlefield today, it, it doesn't exist. Mm. Um, the intersection, the main intersection is still there, but um, it's like a four lane highway going in one direction and a, a you know a two lane county road going the other. Um, everything's built up at shopping centers and all that. So you can't, you can't go visit Drainsville anymore. Um, I have tried, mm. but yeah, it's not there. Um, then you get into, you know, the winter of 61, 62, and McClellan takes command of the army, and, and uh, you know, he's fighting with the Lincoln administration about, you know, the, the best way to go about trying to capture Richmond, which isn't really the best way to win the war anyways, but okay. Um, and he talks them into letting him take his army down to the peninsula, right? Yeah. Okay. So he does that, and the reserves are part of McDowell's Corps, which is left in the defenses of Washington, and so they don't get forwarded until later, right? They go to Falmouth in April. Um, they sit at Falmouth for 
like a month and a half. Uh, and June 8th, they finally get to White House, or they finally leave Falmouth for White House Landing. I think they actually, the reserves actually got there, uh, I believe June 10th. It took them two days to get there. Um, meanwhile, four companies of bucktails have been split off and sent with a small cavalry brigade uh, to the valley to go chase Jeb Stewart. Um, and in the process, they end up killing Turner Ashby at Harrisonburg. Um, okay. uh, they, they, they fight very hard uh, and by all accounts, very well. Uh, they are, it's legitimately four companies of infantry that have been attached to the first Pennsylvania cavalry, uh, the first New Jersey cavalry and the second main battery, uh, which for this campaign is mounted artillery, right? So they're not the horse artillery. I'm sorry. So they're all mounted. Everybody's got a horse except these four companies of infantrymen from Pennsylvania who are basically at a dead run for a month solid trying to keep up with cavalry and horse artillery and fighting the whole time and chasing Jackson around. And, and I, it's, it's incredible. But the rest of the reserves get to White House Landing. Um, and, and so at the, the beginning of the seven days at Mechanicsville, um, there are roughly 7,000 men in the division. They only account for one fifteenth of the Army's combat power on the peninsula, right? <clears throat> at Mechanicsville, there's a company of the Bucktails that is cut off, surrounded, and captured. Uh, they spend, it's Company K, they spend five days running around in the swamps trying to get themselves back to the Army. Um, and July, so Mechanicsville is on June 26th, uh, on July 1st. They're, they're trying to cross this road in full view of a rebel camp a couple hundred yards away. And the last half a dozen dudes crossing the road get spotted. Huh. And they're, that's how they finally surrender. And then they spend the next, uh, six weeks or so, uh, in Richmond as guests of the rebels. Um, the next day, at Gaines's Mills, uh, companies D and E are cut off, uh, and they are also captured, along with most of the 11th reserves. Uh, George McCall and John Reynolds is wounded. <laughs> yeah. Or I'm sorry, John Reynolds is captured. George McCall is captured. Um, the 11th reserves, almost to a man, are captured, and two more companies of the six remaining companies of the Bucktails are captured. Right. You know, uh, 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 one thing I just thought there <laughs> with uh, with being, is it safe to say in a way, you know, just from our basic knowledge here that uh, it was better, you never want to be captured, but it was right. better to be captured in 62 versus 64. Oh my God, yeah. Well, Andersonville you know, does not exist and you have a right. chance of being exchanged. Right. And 62. well, the Dix Hill cartel said very, very explicitly that you were only supposed to hold on to prisoners for like six weeks, I think is what it was. It is a, it, they did stipulate a specific amount of time that you were hold, you were allowed to hold men as prisoners before you either had to exchange them uh, or you had to parole them, right? And of course, you know that breaks down in '63. Mm -hmm. It doesn't ever really get rebuilt. I, you know, you've got random little exchanges here and there. Uh, there's the the big one in December of '64, um, but outside of that, you know, like really post Gettysburg, like if you're captured, you're going to spend the rest of the war probably um, in, mm -hmm. in prison uh, if yeah. you don't die before the end of the war. Right? So anyways, I, you know, uh, we get through the seven days and just to illustrate how rough it was for the reserves overall, right? They've lost the division commander, George McCall. He's, he's uh, captured. They've lost John Reynolds, captured. George Meade is wounded and has to leave to recuperate. Um, their, their temporary division commander is now the chief of artillery of the reserves, Truman Seymour. Uh, and when, when they file, so Hugh McNeil, who was commanding the, the rifles at the time, had taken ill at Falmouth and been sent to hospital. Well, he is at Harrison's Landing at the end of the seven days. And he's there to, you know, meet his regiment coming in uh, to Harrison's Landing. And there are 64 men total. That's it. That is that is the entirety of six companies is now 64 men. Um, 
overall, like I said at the beginning of this little spiel, uh, the reserves accounted for one fifteenth of the combat power of the army at the beginning of the seven, th- seven days. They suffered one fifth of the army's total casualties. Uh, the day before Mechanicsville, they had roughly seven thousand men. Uh, at the end of the seven days, there's like 3,500 of them left. That's it, right? And it doesn't get any better for them through the rest of 62. Um, they're at second. They're at second Manassas, right? Uh, they they don't do a ton of fighting. Like they're posted on Chin Ridge early in the day, uh, but they don't actually fight on Chin Ridge because as uh, as Porter is moving his fifth corps forward. Briefly, as it turns out, uh, they're actually being withdrawn to go support uh, another part of the line. Uh, and they get zero credit for this, but they are there with the Division of U.S. Regulars covering the withdrawal of the Army. So it's the Regulars and to their left are the Reserves on Henry House Hill. Uh, and those two divisions are what allow um, – allow the army to be withdrawn from the battlefield without being just destroyed. The badasses. Uh, you know, they, <laughs> they go to the defenses of Washington. Uh, the army's only there for like two weeks tops um, before, you know, we have the Maryland campaign. And it's, it's this brief period in Washington where the regiment is, is the, the bucktails are re-equipped with sharks rifles, uh, which they love. Um, but they go, they go into, uh, South Mountain. There's like 3,600 guys left. I don't have my notes handy. I, I could give you exact numbers. Um, they are responsible for driving in Longstreet's left on, uh, Frosttown Gap, which makes Turner's Gap, uh, untenable. Uh, and Longstreet has to withdraw off of South Mountain. Right. So the reserves are responsible for driving in Longstreet's left. Mm. Um, without that happening, I don't think Longstreet would have been forced to leave the ridge um, as quickly as he did. <clears throat> we go to Antietam. We go to Sharpsburg. Right. Um, you know, the bloodiest single day in American history. It's there's a pretty good case to be made that it wasn't a single day battle. Um, because the reserves show up on the battlefield on the afternoon of the 16th, and almost the entire division is engaged in and around the East Woods. Um, they, they're, they're receiving artillery um, from, oh, wherever Stewart's Horse artillery was. I forget the name of the hill offhand. Um, they're being fired into their flank from there, uh, and they're, they're engaging – uh, rebels in the East Woods, back and forth. Hugh McNeil, who commands the Bucktails, is killed on the evening wow. of the 16th, uh, and then on the morning of the 17th, you know, they're 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 firing at each other in the East Woods until um, close to midnight, uh, and then several times during the course of the night, uh, something will go bump in the dark, uh, and everybody just starts blasting at each other again for a couple of minutes. And then it quiets back down. That happens several times through the course of the evening. But that gets uh, but overlooked then, a lot. Uh, oh, all yeah, those events. The, you know, the, people just look at what happened on the 17th. and right, not, Nobody talks about yeah. the, the fighting in and around the East Woods on the 16th done by the Pennsylvania Reserves. Uh, and then, you know, the next day on the 17th, it's the Reserves that stop Hood's counterattack through the cornfield. It is, it, it is two brigades of the Reserves that stop that cold. And it's the Ninth Reserves that basically wipe the first Texas off the face of the earth and capture their colors, right? We don't talk about that. We talk about the Iron Brigade, right? We'll talk about the yeah. Irish Brigade. We don't talk about the Reserves. And right? by the and way, they have really... they have beautiful monuments in Antietam. Like, uh, <laughs> oh, they do. Almost they every do. reserve has a representative monument there. Well, there's uh, there's only four regiments there. There's a third, fourth, seventh, and eighth. Uh, okay. And the only reason they have monuments there is because they were not at Gettysburg. They were they were the second brigade of the division. Yes. And they were left in the defenses of Washington yes. as the compromise between the reserves and the War Department for the rest of them to go to Pennsylvania. 
right? And we can talk about that in a minute, but uh, the, 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 their single best day of fighting is, is probably December 13th, right? At Fredericksburg on Prospect Hill that yeah. nobody talks about ever. We talk about the 16th Maine at Slaughter Pen Farm. We talk about Gibbons uh, Division. We don't talk about the division sized hole that the Pennsylvania Reserves have put in the middle of Jackson's line and hold entirely unsupported for the better part of a half an hour before they run out of ammunition and Early's counterattack finally shoves them out because they don't have any bullets, right? And yeah. Gibbons, Div- like, Gib- <laughs> people don't talk about this at all. Gibbons Division uh, and Bernese Division right after them don't show up in time to exploit that breach and basically just fight an action to allow what's left of the reserves to extricate themselves uh, without being wiped out. Yeah. That that's it. Right. But, you know, we'll talk about we'll talk about, you know, the, the Irish Brigade getting oh they're the closest to get to the wall. Yeah. Well, the reserve punched a huge, a huge hole in Jackson's line. That if John Reynolds hadn't been running around citing individual guns and doing his job as a corps commander could have been exploited. And we potentially could be talking about a very different war. Yes. Well, I was just about to say uh, when, you know, arguably, if Fredericksburg had been a union victory, maybe we'd be talking about the breakthrough even more. We could but because be. it still yeah. resulted in a federal defeat. Is that why not much attention is given to that? Or, you know, it's just like I, it was I don't an incredible know that it's, feat during the battle. I don't know that it's necessarily because of that. Um, I, I think, you know, everything before the Gettysburg campaign, not everything, but for the most part, it feels like for the longest time, everything prior to Gettysburg has been focused on um, Confederate victory and how Confederates achieved that victory. And then everything post Gettysburg has been very much about how did they lose, Mm -hmm. which comes down to Grant grinding everybody down uh, on the Overland campaign. Right. So the, the, the focus on, on the reserves being successful at Fredericksburg would run counter to the idea that Jackson was a demigod uh, and was never defeated in battle, which is absolutely untrue, and would take the focus away from Longstreet's Corps just slaughtering Yankees in an open field on the other end of the line. So we'll ignore this part because it doesn't look too good. Uh, and we'll focus on that because, you know, it, it one, it makes us look great. Uh, and two, it makes the, the Yankees look like morons because uh, they just kept walking across an open field, right? Like that, I, again, I don't have anything to, like, qualify that, but that's just kind of how it's felt mm-hmm. for me for a long time. Um, but, but Fredericksburg, for the reserves, they're, they are slaughtered at Fredericksburg. There's, there's 4,500 men in the division, and that includes two brand new regiments, the 121st and 142nd PA. Uh, they suffer 1,800 casualties on Prospect Hill, right? And so, you know, they, they go on the mud march with everybody else. Uh, and then at the beginning of February, the War Department takes pity upon them because there's Basically, none of them left, right? We left Pennsylvania in July of 61 with like 13,000 men in these 13 infantry regiments. Um, We just had 4,500 men in the division, but that was only because we got two brand new infantry regiments. There's maybe 3,000 of the original reserves left, uh, and we just lost 1,800 guys at Prospect Hill. Right. You've got regiments that total like 150 men. And so they decide to pull them out of line and they send them to the defenses of Washington. 
uh, to yeah. recruit and recoup losses and all that. And that's where they are uh, in June 63 uh, when, when Lee goes into to Pennsylvania. Well, you know, I have here. I hope all um, that made sense. It does. <laughs> and I actually, I have some letters or I have some entries about the second brigade of the reserves and their point of view uh, okay. being left behind right. uh, in the Gettysburg campaign. But, Not but before, uh, before I dive into that, you know, it, it does go, you're right. Like everything the reserves have done is, is equal, if not greater in some of the moments of the Irish brigade, iron brigade and all these other household unit names, like, and why is the reserves. And, and like you were saying, like a lot of times, it's just the way it works out, but okay, they're heavily involved the night before Antietam, or they're heavily involved July 4th at Gettysburg, or they're, they're heavily, and it's like, right. it, it may not, they're heavily involved, but it may not be on that primary moment day that everyone else is accustomed to, but they're doing the part and playing huge roles there. Well, a, a, a lot of, a lot of how we interpret, you know, the Eastern theater, right? And by Eastern theater, I'm talking about, you know, Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, right? AOP, A and B. A lot of how we interpret that is based on how Gettysburg gets interpreted, right? So things that are popular at Gettysburg become, by default, popular everywhere else. Um, now, that, I feel, has been the case with the Iron Brigade. I'm not trying to denigrate anything that they did during the course of the war because they did fight. Very hard, but I would argue that everything that the Iron Brigade did was not as anywhere near as consequential as anything that the reserves did, right? Again, we're talking about the seven days. They allow the Army to withdraw and move their base of supply from White House Landing to Harrison's Landing, right? Again, I can quantify that by percentage of loss. One fifteenth of the army accounts for one fifth of the army's casualties. Yeah, I would say they probably had more to do with that being a successful retrograde movement than any other division in the army at the time. Right uh, at Second Manassas, okay, they're not involved in Chin Ridge. They luckily get left out of Porter's disastrous advance, uh, but they and the regulars stop. Lee from being able to pursue, right? I, full yeah. stop. That yeah. period. Um, the Maryland campaign, right? You can make arguments for, you know, how consequential they are at South Mountain. I would argue that they're fairly consequential uh, for the reasons I laid out previously. Uh, but then at Antietam, they're not just involved on the evening of the 16th. Uh, they're also heavily involved on the morning of the 17th. The later stages of, of, you know, the cornfield fight, uh, is, is the reserves stopping Hood's counterattack. And without that, where are we on the north end of the field on September 17th? I don't think it, the army's in a very good position. But, uh, and then of course, you know, Fredericksburg, right? They, they yeah. Yeah. very nearly made it a very different war. Uh, and, you know, if people had been paying attention and doing what they were supposed to be doing. Um, it, it goes back, Eric, it, to... But at Gettysburg, right? At Gettysburg, they they only suffer 17% casualties. And you know my opinion on, on that whole... Yeah, mm -hmm. but if you want to hear that, you can listen to the last episode. <laughs> um, but they get left out of the Gettysburg story for a number of reasons. One, it's not Pickett's charge, and two, it's not Joshua Chamberlain, right? I would argue that it may not have been their most momentous engagement of the war, but it certainly was not nothing, right? You, you have McCandless's brigade coming into line on this gap, which would, what would otherwise be a gap on the north slope of Little Round Top and Munchower's Knoll, the Sixth Corps we know is coming, but they're not there quite yet. And you've got the division of regulars being thrown out of the wheat field and closely pursued by either all or parts of four separate Confederate brigades. 
And McCandless's brigade for a short period of time is the only thing stopping them from cutting Little Round Top off from the rest of the army. Right. That's not nothing. And I understand that, you know, uh, like, like hey, the Bucktail Regiment. I'm sorry. I think I said 17 percent casualties for, for McCandless's brigade. It's 12. It's 17 percent for the Bucktail Regiment specifically. Right. They suffer 56 casualties. There's there's 12 killed or mortally wounded, um, 40 wounded and then uh, two captured and two missing. Right. That's over the course of, you know, a day and a half because they get there, you know, evening of the second. Uh, they they throw Confederates back across the wheat field, uh, which I've heard so many people say, well, they were already withdrawing. I haven't found uh, in at least in my interpretation of the official records, I haven't found where anybody said that they had ordered these brigades to withdraw. There's there's one of them, uh, I think Benning's brigade. One of the Georgia regiments in Benning's brigade actually makes the claim that they uh, <laughs> they they repelled like seven or eight separate assaults on their position before withdrawing. Is that's madness? There's no way that's possible. <laughs> um, but things like that, they they don't talk about. You know, we received orders to withdraw, uh, and then the Pennsylvania reserves came running after us. Like nobody's saying. But anyways, they they get overlooked at Gettysburg. Uh, in the modern era, which which to me translates into we're going to overlook their contributions for the rest of the war in the Eastern Theater, because if it's not if it's not super valuable at Gettysburg, we're just not going to pay attention to it. Right. And that, that's a travesty, too, because uh, and, and, and like they're you not said... and they're not an ethnically based regiment either. Right. Which yeah. is why which is why I feel the Irish Brigade gets more attention uh, overall is, you know, they're, they're Irish, right? Yeah. Like everybody's Irish, but these are still Pennsylvanians fighting on Pennsylvania soil. Absolutely. It should matter for something. And I, it but, should, but it goes back to, uh, like we both talked about before, like, um, every regiment matters on every battlefield. Absolutely. You go to. So everyone has a story to tell every regiment. And that, that was the goal of my project too, was to kind of bring to light, all these anecdotes and stories from all these writing, like, cause you could be like, Oh wow. I didn't know this thing happened with the 98th PA or like, I never heard right. of them. It was like, well, you need to hear of them and find out, okay, who are these guys? Where did they come from? And where, what did they do before Gettysburg and after Gettysburg? And absolutely. And all of them deserve time. That's why, you know, we can get frustrated sometimes with, with Chamberlain and 20 men. Cause you just, you hear it and see it all the time when we know, Right, uh, guys oh, like us even, know we know every single regiment in Gettysburg and what you know. And don't, so don't even get me started on the 12th yeah. Corps, man. Oh, no. <laughs> the, the, the 12th Corps is 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 a story that doesn't get told really by anybody anywhere, mm -hmm. which is baffling to me. Yeah, um, because they're I love them. you know you know you've got Cedar Mountain and then basically from the Antietam campaign through the end of. The Gettysburg campaign, they're involved in everything the Army of the Potomac does in one way, shape, or form. Uh, and then they go west, and they're at Chickamauga. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or not Chickamauga. They're at uh, Chattanooga. Rissaka. Right. They, I, they, all the way campaign. through the Atlanta campaign, mm -hmm. uh, they, go to the, they go to Savannah. Wauhatchee. Um, it's, it's, it's a 12th Corps regiment uh, that enters Savannah first. Yeah. Uh, the 3rd Wisconsin. Yeah. Uh, they they go to they go to South Carolina, they go to North Carolina, and then they end up yeah. uh, in in D.C. for the uh, the Grand Review. But nobody talks about that stuff um, because it's not it's not Eastern theater uh, Eastern theater centric. Uh, Joshua Chamberlain didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, there's basically no Irishmen around. Uh, it, <laughs> it, it, it's it, it's incredible like how things get weighted. Uh, within the historical community, and they don't really get talked about at Gettysburg because, again, they're not suffering these massive casualties in the 12th Corps at Gettysburg. They are laying the hurt down on Ewell's Corps, uh, but they themselves are not getting beat up as badly. Well, you know, as it turns out, if you get behind a pile of dirt with logs and rocks in it, like it's exponentially better than just being standing <laughs> up 
in front of the guy behind I, and the i love all those boxes. debates and arguments there like between geary and green because geary thinks it's unmanly to to build breastworks like that and right. green's like no listen right. to me we need to dig in and like, i don't Geary's care like, what you have to say about it <laughs> we're doing uh, this and again, yeah, you're right. They they suffer probably the least the least casualty. Or no, I'm sorry, take away the six score. Beyond the six score, the twelve right. suffers probably the least amount of casualties. Yeah, relatively. But low. but inflict some of the most damage. Oh my god, it's horrifying. Yeah. Right. How you read the accounts of of the aftermath on Culp's Hill. Yeah, they can't is, even walk on the ground. You know. There's, yeah. There's one from the 29th, or there's one from the 111th PA. Uh, it was written by a guy in Company D. Uh, we don't have the date on it because. For whatever reason, the original, the corner that had the date uh, is torn off. Um, but this guy wrote it, uh, it probably in the 1890s. Uh, and he was telling his, I believe it was his niece, about his time in service. He gives a great account of Antietam. Uh, he talks about, uh, you know, we expended something like 120 rounds of kill seed. Like, he doesn't refer to it as ammunition. It's kill seed. I wow. always thought that was great. That's um, unique, yeah. He very specifically does not talk about the fighting in Gettysburg, but he does talk about the aftermath. And he's talking about um, uh, he witnesses this one mass grave being filled up with Confederates. He says there's 75 of them going to one grave. Uh, and the last one is a first or is an orderly sergeant. And this fellow from the 29th PA comes dragging this body over by the legs, throws him in and says, there, damn you, call the roll and see if they're all there. Mm. Oh, my God. Like, that was wow. amazing to me. Yeah. Right? I, it's incredible stuff. Yeah. Like, nobody nobody printed things like that, with maybe yeah. the, the exception of, like, Frank Wilkeson when he wrote his reminiscences. Mm -hmm. um, but he's kind of the exception to, to you know, that late 19th century – Victorian, flowery, glorified writing that, you know, if you pick up a regimental history, 99% of the time it's going to be written like that, you know, just very uh, erudite, I think is yeah. the word for it. It's, and, it's well, incredible stuff. Th there, there's another uh, thing you could even talk about is Pardee Field at Culp's Hill and the charge sure. of the 147th PA, right? right. You know, and that's Candy's something that Brigade. people don't know about or don't talk about, you know, and, no, and don't visit, not. you know? No. And, uh, but it sticks out when you drive through Culp's Hill. You see, like, what's well, that big rock in the middle of the field? Of <laughs> you know, it, no. What everybody that, knows about you know. what everybody knows about Culp's Hill is is you know, uh, you know they they had a party overnight on the second and third down Spring. in Spangler Spring. You know, just <laughs> laying back and drinking water together, and and you come to find out if you do any research, like. There is absolutely no contemporaneous accounts that say anything even remotely like that. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, there's a really good one uh, in in the Third Wisconsin's regimental history. In the back of it, uh, they have a whole bunch of different um, uh, different vignettes that were written by various guys in the regiment yeah, for publication. Yeah. Uh, but there's one. Um, I for, I think Company C, the the company commander for Company C wrote about um, on the morning of the third, you know, this is before, this is before the 27th Indiana and the, the second mass uh, go across the field. They're, they're laying yeah. in their works and uh, they're looking across Spangler's Meadow uh, towards lower Culp's Hill. And uh, there's this wounded man laying out in between the lines who is, his he's, he's begging piteously for water. Right, calling for water constantly, and this is going on for a couple of hours. And finally, this dude in the third Wisconsin finally just he has had enough. He jumps up, he throws all of his accoutrements off, grabs a canteen, and runs out to this guy. Right, and and he's being shot out while he's going forward, which is understandable. You know, a random dude running at you, and he's in the wrong color clothes. Mm -hmm. um, he gets to the wounded man. Lays down next to him, gives him a drink, leaves him the canteen, right? In full view of the Confederate line. They know what's happening. You can see it very clearly. And when he gets back up to run back to his works, they start firing at him more furiously than they were when he was going out, right? I don't know how you could conflate a story like that with 
on the night of July 2nd, we got together and everybody <laughs> laid aside their differences for some cool, clear water. Like that's not, that's not realistic. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. I'm Amen rambling. to that, man. No, no, but that's, I know guys like guys just, just, just read into it. Like there's just so many awesome accounts and, and like the digger. I mean, the more you dig, the deeper you dig, it's like, um, I don't know, like some, like we just don't read enough sometimes and, and keep pursuing these topics. But I see my, my problem is I love researching and I will run headfirst down a rabbit hole as far as that thing will go. <laughs> and I will completely forget what I was what I was trying to do at yep. the beginning. So I'll find all these like ridiculous first first uh, or uh, primary source accounts that are essentially meaningless to anybody but me, and that'll get filed away for a rainy day like mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. But overall, big picture stuff like I, this is going to be shocking. I know very little about confederate actions at gettysburg like i cannot name you all the brigade commanders in longstreet's corps it is not anything that has ever interested me i know the ones that are involved with the things that i'm interested mm -hmm. in studying but it's mm -hmm. not that it's it's a secondary thing that i have to have the background for it to put what i'm looking at into context but it's not something that I'm willing to dig into. Yeah. Right. And yeah. that's, that's a horrible thing to say, but like, I've only got so much capacity for, for retaining any of this stuff. Like I, I have well, the it, things that I'm passionate about yeah. and that's what I want to talk. About. And you're not, you don't run out of material to dig into uh, of all the stuff on, on your side oh God, too, no, you know? Right? So it's like, there's still uh, stuff out there. Like we were yeah, talking about earlier. So yeah, and, absolutely. Now, one thing that um, I am making myself dig deeper into A and V. I, I've always been obsessed with the entire Order of Battle of Gettysburg as a whole, but I'm, I'm a huge right. Army, of, Army of Potomac buff. But I'm really making myself now because I'm making the Confederate counterpart series to the series I just did. Right. Now I'm doing the A and V. But a lot of like I spent three years just doing this <laughs> AOP project and. Right. And I could have gone way deeper than I did. And I knew that um, oh, I'm sure. just going to, I can't go too far. And so I just went as far as I could. But at the same time, um, everyone's also anxious. Like, okay, you need to do the A&V series. Like, come on, where <laughs> is it? Let's see it. And it's like, uh, and I want it to happen. And I'm working on it. I'm doing preliminary stuff now. But it's a lot harder, you know. And it's right. uh, there's not as many resources. Like, not every Confederate regiment has a regimental history, you know. Exactly. And, and not everybody wrote about it. And, and uh, so that's one whole adventure on, on its own. But well, good uh, luck, Eric, <laughs> I, I can't believe it, man. Uh, we could talk all night and it's already, um, uh, we're already winding down. <laughs> but um, uh, just another excuse to have you back on again, because uh, we'll hey, just have to talk, want, man. talk more Pennsylvania regiments. And uh, I hope that we gave a lot of attention to uh, the reserves and, and maybe uh Listeners here can dig deeper into the reserves. Check them out hope, more. I just hope people <laughs> could understand my babbling, because I oh, feel I like think. that chart. I feel like that Charlie Day meme from "It's Always Sunny," like I, especially <laughs> like last week <laughs> yeah. when I had books scattered across my shop. I felt <sighs> like that. Like I just needed to start putting stuff on the walls, pinning it together with uh, with red uh, red yarn. Well, well, Eric, part of the reason I, I made a podcast was to be able to rant and banter with people about these things because nobody else cares. If I talked about this at work, who cares? You know, like uh, like I've tried talking to my family members before and they appreciate it to an extent, but not like uh, we have to. This is healthy for us to, to get right. this out. Right? We have to. And uh, absolutely. Like, you're not the only one, Eric. You know, uh, we all we all got it. We all want to talk about. It. And uh, what I appreciate about this is. I have all these random, so I appreciate an episode like tonight where we could just banter about random, whatever we think right, about. You because can, you can like brain dump the things that are just like cluttering your mind and it, it can make you a little bit more clear headed for the task at hand. And like, okay, like I might interview a guy about a book that he wrote about Atlanta campaign, but in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about something I just heard about 
in Gettysburg or something I heard about right. about Chickamauga. And I'm like, I really want to bring this up. But then I'm thinking, well, wait, if I bring this up, it makes no context, no <laughs> sense to what we're talking about. And uh, and it's just going to derail the whole interview. But, uh, but like you're just chomping at the bit. Like, I want to talk about this regiment. I just heard about a cold harbor <laughs> or like, oh, uh, wow. anyway, but, but Absolutely. man, I, I, we could, I love yeah. having this sort of a conversation. Yeah. So maybe we can make this a more regular current sometimes. <laughs> Whenever you want to do it, man, you let me man. know. But I work hey, for myself. Before, so, well, let's talk about that for a second before we go here. <laughs> okay. Um, you, you work for yourself and you, uh, yeah. you're, you, you have a lever goods company called Von Denim right. company. Um, and uh, tell us a little bit about your work there and, and what you do. So, so I am, I'm not making really any reproduction stuff. I'm, I'm looking at maybe getting into that, but it's, I, it kind of looks like a zero sum game from where I'm sitting. Um, what I do currently is I make, um, uh, modern leather goods, right? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. bags primarily, um, but I do, you know, belts and other stuff too. Uh, kind of whatever you want. Uh, with like a kind of like a historical design spin on it. Um, so what I've been making the most of lately are these over the shoulder bags. It's kind of a messenger bag, uh, but I based the whole design and a lot of the styling off of a, uh, it's either an 1860s or 1870s men's valise. Uh, which I actually just made one of for uh, Will Eichler from oh, wow. uh, Civil War okay. Digital Digest. Yeah, uh, I I made him, uh, you know, the proper valise. Uh, but these are based off of that. Um, so a lot of the the outward styling, the lines, things like that, uh, are mid nineteenth century. But it's it's specifically built to be like a modern messenger bag, not a hand toted valise. Um, mm. And it, unless you knew that it was, you know, based on 19th century design, you wouldn't know. The other thing is all of my, all of my uh, uh, production techniques are mid 19th century, right? I, I usually tell people there's, there's only three things in my shop aside from the lights that draw any power. Uh, my phone charger, uh, the coffee pot, uh, which has never had coffee in it. I use it to keep oil hot. Uh, and uh, a little bench grinder looking machine that I have on the corner uh, for burnishing edges because it can do it a hell of a lot better than anybody can do it by hand that I've seen so far. And it is exponentially faster. But other than that, like I don't have a sewing machine. Um, I'm I'm working on maybe some clicker dies for certain things, but I've been doing so much custom work that it doesn't make sense for me to get clicker dies made because everything's a different dimension anyways, so it doesn't matter. Um, but it's all it's all freehand cut. Uh, wow. Everything's assembled with 19th century techniques. Uh, the only real concession I make is uh, my thread. Uh, I use primarily uh, flat woven or flat braided. Uh, polyester thread uh, for a couple of reasons, not least of which is linen thread doesn't last worth a damn. It, it'll rot right out well before the leather gives up the ghost. Uh, and uh, kit waxing or sewing uh, with kit waxed linen thread uh, is the bane of my existence. It is so sticky. It, it <laughs> takes me at least twice as long to sew the same thing with kit waxed linen as it does uh, just waxed flat braided uh, polyester. Anyways, that's wow. the, that's the whole idea. If you want to check out what I'm doing, it's Von Dedham and Co. on uh, uh, Facebook and Instagram. I don't have a website, um, but it's spelled V-O-N space D-E-T-T-U-M and co um yeah you can check me out on facebook and instagram under that handle sweet thank you eric and i'll be sure I'm, i'll make note of that in the show notes too right so, on, man. so no worries Appreciate if you, you miss the spelling you can just check the show notes too. <laughs> <laughs> we got you we got you covered sure. but um <laughs> hey thanks so much eric it was Absolutely, a pleasure dude. i i love yeah. doing these yeah I, uh, yeah i appreciate really it. flattered you had me back on no, and, and uh, I think uh, 
great beards and great minds think alike. And so, um, uh, yeah, I'd love to make this a more regular occurrence. Uh, let's not wait two years till next time. I, so. you let me know when, man. I, yeah. I'm, I'm down for whatever. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Erica. Best wishes on all your projects and all your work. Yeah, thanks, man. Good luck. And... Uh, good luck writing the AMV order yeah. of battle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, pray for me, everybody. I will. Uh, but no, <laughs> no, I appreciate it. And and everyone, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did too. And and uh, hope you learned something new and a new appreciation for for Pennsylvania soldiers and regiments. And so, with that being said, thank you for listening and and have a good night, everybody. <laughs> Bye.